All right, good evening. Thank you for joining us. So uh, we have a very serious matter to discuss. This is something that a lot of people have commented on on social media. Um, and I wanted to give it a day or two for all of the details of the case to emerge, for people to sort of digest the information, uh, for my panelists to also get some time uh, to sort of read through the entire case history so we can discuss what exactly happened with this case and why it's so worrying. Now, um, most of you might have read some of this on social media. Uh, the latest update on this particular story is that a group of more than 4,000 women rights activists have apparently written an open letter to the Chief Justice of India saying he must step down for asking a rapist to marry his school-going victim and justifying marital rape in the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm reading that out of his story. Now, Effectively, what happened was inside of court in a um, anticipatory bail hearing, which was uh, against a rape accused, the Chief Justice of India apparently, as reported in uh, these various articles, asked government employee Mohit Chavan, accused of repeatedly raping a 16-year-old, if he's willing to marry her. Now, what happened after that, um, obviously, was the outrage on social media. But before we get to the actual core questions I want to ask this evening, I want to read out the entire story to you as reported by Bar and Bench so that everybody understands the history of this case before we talk about the details. Now, according to Bar and Bench, the accused used to follow the 16 year old girl from her school to her home on a regular basis. One day when her family members were not at home, he entered the house through the back door. He gagged the victim's mouth tied her hands and legs and raped her. He then threatened the victim that he would throw acid on her face if she disclosed the incident to anyone. I must for a second stop here and uh, forgive me for not warning our viewers earlier that there are some viewers who might find these details distressing. I should have given you uh, that portion at the beginning. Apparently the accused also allegedly threatened to harm her family members and her if she went ahead and spoke to anybody and using these threats, he repeatedly raped the victim who was in the ninth standard around 10 to 12 times. One day the victim attempted suicide and was stopped by her mother, which is when she told her mother what had happened. When the mother and the daughter were on their way to the police station to file a complaint, the accused mother stopped them and promised them that she would get her son married to this survivor when the survivor turns 18. Remember she's 16 at this point. It was further alleged that the petitioner's mother, the accused's mother, asked the victim's illiterate mother to sign a stamp paper saying there was only a consensual affair between the two individuals. When the victim or the survivor turned 18, the accused refused to marry her. At which point a fresh complaint was filed with the police under sections of rape, cheating, criminal intimidation, um, sexual assault under POXO, which is the uh, you know, which is the law against uh, crime of sexual nature against children, punishment of sexual harassment, and so on. The petitioner was granted anticipatory bail by the Sessions Court in Jalgaon. Uh, the Aurangabad bench of the Bombay High Court cancelled that anticipatory bail, saying it was atrocious that someone accused of multiple counts of rape under POXO would be granted bail at all after which the individual has now approached the Supreme Court. Uh, what happened in the Supreme Court is that he has been given protection from arrest uh, for a period of time. Here are the questions that I want to ask, but also to my viewers, please add your own questions. Uh, the Chief Justice is mentioned, is, is quoted saying, um, you know, you should have thought about this before you seduced and raped a young girl. Now the details of the case tell us that she was gagged and bound and tied up and raped. The confusion of seduction and rape, the confusion of seduction for a 16 year old, uh, consent for a 16 year old. The idea of marital rape, which also came up in a later case where the same, uh, you know, where the same court had mentioned that when two people are living together, a husband and wife, irrespective of how brutal the husband is, can what happens between them be called rape at all? That's another question we have to answer. Settling a dispute through marriage, can rape be actually seen as a, as a matter that needs to be sort of settled? Or is it a heinous crime as pointed out to us by our laws? And the idea of maybe mixing up honor 
with the mental and physical trauma of being married to one's rapist? These are the questions that I would like to ask now to help us answer these questions. Joining me this evening, um, Gita Lutra, Senior Advocate for the Supreme Court, Karuna Nandi, Advocate for the Supreme Court. Nishta Satyam is the Deputy Country Representative UN Women in India, Bhutan, Maldives, and Sri Lanka uh, for the United Nations. And Brinda Adige is a very vocal activist. Um, also points for me and my team that we have an all women's panel again. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I, if I may start with Karuna Nandi. Uh, Ms. Nandi, good evening, and thank you for good joining evening. us. And I'll bring in Ms. Rutha to respond because I know she has a slightly different point of view. Um, if you would just help us understand how to interpret what was said in court, because this is not the order. This is the this is a conversation that the judge was having with the with the lawyer of the accused. What does this really mean, and how serious is it? It's a new day in terms of open justice. We have simultaneous reportage of what happens in court by very responsible, by of course others as well, but also by very responsible court reporters like Live Law and Bar and Bench, who are pretty much all lawyers and understand what's going on. The court itself restricted under Justice, uh, the Chief Justice of India, Justice Kapadia's regime. Um, they restricted who can come to court and report. Right in the Supreme Court. They said that you have to have a law degree. Now, regardless of what you may think of that, um, people now can hear what judges are saying off the cuff. Now, judges and others who participate in such hearings are also a bit wary of such comments being reported or blown up or taken so seriously because sometimes you may ask a question or you may want some sort of free flowing thought and then your judgment may be really quite different once you've asked the question and once you've thought about it. And, um, so you don't want that process to be trammeled. Having said that, what fell from the bench in this case Honestly, I um, well, let me tell you the truth. When I first read this, I thought this was a promise to marry case, right? I thought this was a case, the kind of case I never take. I'm not completely close to it, but I never take it for various different reasons, right? Because I think yes. it's complicated. I think the idea of consent there is complicated. The idea of waiving your fundamental right is complicated. I thought it was the kind of case where a man was in a relationship with a woman. He promised to marry her. They had sexual intercourse and then she uh, and then the relationship fell apart and which is why um, the case was being brought as a case of rape. The reason I thought this was not entirely unfounded, it was founded on the fact that the judge said that she had been seduced and why are you not marrying her, right? I think these are the only circumstances in which this sort of comment would be um, okay. The reason that I think that this anger across yeah. ideologies, across classes, across the nation is happening is because what this is doing is that this is going to the heart of women's rights. And this has also seems to be reflected in an order which is protecting this alleged brutal child rapist being arrested yeah. and when the highest court in this country and when the chief justice of the country makes such widely reported remarks that then reflects in an order of protection protecting the employment of this man as opposed to the right to life yeah. of this person who was a child when she was raped right of course, that is going to sort of spark the kind of feeling of what are my rights? Am I a citizen of this country? Where can I go? Let me, you know? very well said. Let me bring in uh, Ms. Gita Lutra. Ms. Lutra, the question is this even if we were to argue that these, this was a conversation between judge and lawyer, this was not part of the order, it's just being reported, people are reacting. But doesn't it give us a window? into 
the thought process. I mean, I would be very, very concerned if anybody at all thought it was okay for someone who brutally raped a 16-year-old to be married to that 16-year-old. But I want to understand how, how you're reading these comments uh, from the bench. So, so there were two matters, if I'm not mistaken. One yes. was, I think there was an item 13 and an item 14. So first, let me talk about item 14, because somewhere the way the reportage has come is it's mixing up both the matters. And um, I tried to make an inquiry into the matter, because what I think of the Chief Justice is that he is the first one to have, you know, spoken up and, you know, that skin to skin a case came up and we yes. had signed a petition for the National Commission for Women, etc. So it was, um, it was not something which seemed to me to be chronologically correct. So uh, what, I, what appears to be as far as item 14 is concerned, which is the latter ma matter, the girl and the boy were both working in a call center. The girl was 20 years of age. In her counter, as well as in her various affidavits, she has taken various stance. One stance of which was that she was married to the boy. The boy has taken a stance that he and she were going around for a period from the age of 20 till whatever, another three years, I think. So we assume 23. And then somewhere he says that I wanted to marry her. And she says that I, his case, I'm telling you his case. So what's got reported is one version but I'm giving you what I believe are both the versions. So you are you are referring to the, the comment made on marital rape, not the he, Poxo case we're talking about. No, no. And I don't even know if that's a Poxo case because they, the case have been confused. So oh. that's why I'm talking of the 20 year old because it's not this case, particularly Vijay's case is not a Poxo case, even though the way I could understand the two, the reporting, and it's not so clear, it's his first case and second case, but it doesn't come out very clearly. So I'm just telling you about the second item number 14. There was item 13 and 14. And in that, it appears the boy's stance was that I asked the girl, will she marry me? She refused. Then I got married somewhere else. And once I got married somewhere else, and this was after five, six years. So three years of friendship plus one or two years after that. And then she's then made this case against me. So when one of the arguments was that, look, is she, he's been brutal. He's, uh, you know, done this rape and her in one of her counters. And I believe she has filed two, three responses during the course and a 164 statement, which you make, and a 161 statement, etc. And I could be wrong. I haven't looked at that. I've just asked, tried to make inquiries from the advocate on record. What it appears is that the court made this, that marital rape is not an offense. And it was in this uh, context that the court said it. So that's why I'm saying that we don't have the petitions. We have what was said. And I like what Karuna said, that sometimes what is being said in the court cannot be reported because the court's really trying to come to the entire truth of the matter. The, what the order reflects is that the court didn't give a discharge, refused discharge and said, we're giving you some protection because of the contradictory stance, but doesn't use the word contradictory. We're giving you protection for six, eight weeks, but go to the court where your matter is pending 
see if the court believes that you have a good case to give you a discharge so this as far as i have understood it now all that comes uh, uh, and that's how i have understood the petition and the counter now if we just look at it dehors and say the facts were the way the newspaper reportage is then obviously anybody will feel bothered by it that how would you say this in a in the first matter which is item 13 i assume that's the poxo case because in the other case the girl seems to be 20 years the girl and the boy were working together in a call center so that's clearly not couldn't be a poxo case so they've either got and it's on vc so if the 2016 14 have been heard as 14 and 16 i don't know but i'm just so saying so you're saying that the press confused two different cases i no i am saying this case perhaps has been wrongly heard you need to get a copy of the petition and the counter affidavit before okay. we get to the bottom i have tried to verify about the petition as well as the counter affidavit before i came to speak today okay miss nandi do you have a response to that before i bring in the other two guests i have the order before me and what the order says is that the anticipatory bail essentially would the court would have indicated that they're not going to grant the relief and that they probably prompted the uh, council to withdraw the case but it does say it doesn't say that you know go for a discharge or whatever it says that protection is granted until Wait. they go and apply for regular bail this is not standard this happens sometimes in deserving cases it's certainly not standard so what is objective is that the order is there that says that this person gets protection until they go and apply for regular bail why should they get protection is unclear but um that is something that is very much in the court order the fact of two different items and two completely different cases being confused of course it's possible but given that this is these hearings are available on video conferencing and given that its court reporters are all lawyers it does seem somewhat unlikely to me yes it was very widely reported across the media the whole uh, the whole case but let me bring in the other two uh, guests as well um i i just want to bring in vinda and again nishta uh, thank you for being patient now and i i like to give everyone enough time to make their opening statements so vinda adige first uh vinda even if i mean let's let's give all benefit of doubt right that this was a conversation with the judge was trying to understand the full uh, aspect of it this was also perhaps not you know it's not the judgment so hence uh, you know should be understood as such the idea of asking a reputus are you willing to marry um, you know uh, this survivor in what is not a promise to marry case is deeply worrying on many levels isn't it Brenda Yes you're absolutely okay. yeah you're absolutely right fay on one hand you have the court that is supposed to dispense justice because there has been some form of an investigation there is a charge sheet that has been presented before the court various statements now the court's job is to see how justice is dispensed but here you have the court asking this question will you marry her a it immediately tells me that this is in absolutely patriarchal mindset with which he is coming i can understand all these things being said that you know okay we are trying to see if this was a promise to marry a marry case and if it was so then i would first ask the complainant who has registered the case if at all this is only you know i'm uh, thinking aloud but it is not even like that he has gone on to mention you seduced her and then you had sex with her you are a government employee so the court knows very well what are the antecedents or the present situation 
of the culprit, the alleged perpetrator. If this is the case, why would you ask such a question? If you are the court, is it right on your part to ask such a question? Because that then absolutely is frivolous, trivializes the laws that are in place to mm. safeguard and protect women and get justice, A. B, you're blatantly also implying that a woman's agency is not of too much consequence, is not of consequence as, at all. Sexual violence in whichever way, form, manner is also not to be considered too seriously. We will now find out from this government employee how he can safeguard his job and then see that he doesn't go to court. So I will ask such a question. Absolutely unacceptable. It also goes on to show that when people come there, they come with confidence to see that they get some form of justice, which also means some form of punishment to the perpetrator. Neither of this is happening and everything else that is happening is opposite. These are the shades of violence that the victim will anyway is going through in the court. We talk about all the different forms of rape that happens when you question the victim survivor again and again, statement after statement, by the counselor, by the police, by whoever, whoever. And now something like this is also violence, is also, uh, again, demeaning that person who's standing before you seeking that justice. But most of all, why would somebody ask such a question is my big bother and worry. Is it because that uh, you don't have to answer anybody why you ask such a question? Nobody will question you or challenge you as to how come you ask such a question? How dare you ask such a question? Uh, does it uh, defile the decorum of court? Uh, what happens when somebody sitting there does all of these things because often mm -hmm. I hear in uh, various workshops that the judges come there without emotions, neutral. Can this be said like that in this particular situation? Are you really neutral? Are you there without emotions? Haven't you come with prejudices? Is your mindset not there weighing so heavily on you, which is patriarchal, misogynistic, sexist, and a chauvinistic way of saying, will you marry her? Unacceptable. I'm outraged, Faye. Um, okay. I, I don't oh, know. Okay. Make okay. a Ms. very brief yes. point on accuracy, just very yes. briefly. What Brindiga, Brinda Adige is saying um, on which case it was puts the matter to rest because I've cross checked it from you should have thought before seducing and raping the young girl, you are a government servant not a call center employee, you are a government servant. So I think the other mm -hmm. argument can be put to rest. It was in the government servant case, which is the Mohit Subhash Chaman versus the state of Maharashtra. They were in a government, they were in a call center when the relation, it's not about now. But I they were government, government servants. He, he was not a government. Is, no, did no. This is did not, item 14 concern a government servant also? Uh, yes, but it is, can a person be in a call center and then become a government servant? Absolutely. My the, question is different. Have My you question is, position? absolutely. No, you're absolutely right on that. You, Let me you ask you a follow-up question. You, I have, I have checked on this. I'm sure you have. And Which is why, let me I, ask you factually yes, a follow-up question. May I do that? Because I was surprised. And I think that's why when we make statements, uh, we owe a duty to verify our facts. Absolutely. Which is and why. Why? Let I, me let you finish. If I may, yes. if I may ladies, just one moment. I'm, I'm looking at no, the not bar and bench article, Ms. Lutra, no, um, no, that also no. includes, sorry, I beg your pardon, that also includes the orders from the Bombay High Court. Now, the Bombay High Court has listed the name of the individual, which is uh, the accused as Mohit Chavan, and has listed the entire case, which is what I read out at the beginning of the show. So um, that way, I don't think this is being confused. It, it says very clearly that this is a POXO case, uh, that the, uh, you know, the survivor was, I was 16 when it did take place. So there are two matters, as I said. Mo one is Mohit and one is Vijay case. No, so we're, we're only talking about the Mohit case right now. 
and yes. also in, but in if i may just very very briefly say i yes, think yes. arna is talking but, about vijay's case i'm not no that's why i'm not I and my question to you since you've looked at a very pointed question if you could just answer this very pointed, pointed question yes. since you've looked beyond what the rest of us have what, since you've looked at the petitions is the vijay oh, case was vijay a government servant vijay is item 14 is he a government servant that's what they are saying that's But, what they is the order is saying that vijay was a government servant absolutely but now that vijay is a government servant now and mohit was also a government servant mohit of course is a government servant mohit look the question i am telling you is about item 14 which is vijay's case okay. where he is now a government servant yeah and was not was according to the petition made the high court a, a a call center employee in some i couldn't can't i see and was that a promise to marry case it seems the way the girl has said that he married me and the way the boy says and then her second version is or the boy's version is that i offered to marry her she refused then after a year i married somewhere else and then she has filed this case against me this is the boy's version and the girl's version was in one of her counter affidavits that he had married her but okay. her counter affidavits have some have two three versions okay so i think fair to be fair if vijay was also a government servant and this mohit chavan is also a government servant there is some scope for confusion i'm going to mute myself and i'm going to try and verify this while you're talking yes, because, to others uh, though of course when miss rutra uh, says it's completely Aruna, taken as a given but what you were saying of course okay, is there right, many right, things right, you right, wanted let me, let me just bring the conversation so. back and i'll give yes, tara a moment to generically and in the meantime karuna can speak to the advocate on record of okay. both sides in chat okay. all right uh, so i just want to clarify for our audience uh, basically the background checks that that we have done um, on this channel as the journalists is that uh, in the baran bench article there is like i said the entire bombay high court uh, judgment which is attached for mohit subhas chavan versus state of maharashtra which has the entire case history listed out as to what the various submissions were what was in the complaint and what was submitted um, now this particular case and the question according to baran bench and a ton of other journalists and uh, newspapers was the supreme court hearing that same matter so india today hindu times of india hindustan times the new indian express um, and many many others have actually reported it like that but we will allow for karuna nandi to just uh, check one more time and i want to go to my fourth guest who's been very patient nishta satyam is the deputy country representative un uh, women india uh, ms satyam thank you so much i apologize for keeping you waiting but um, fundamentally there is the question that i want to ask here that i think the question that made a lot of women uh, across the country very uncomfortable with uh, with the story was this that on one hand we have solid well written laws but on the other hand there is this idea of honor that can be purged the dishonor that can be purged with marriage how deep do you think that is and how long is it going to be before we can you know sort of remove that from our uh, law and justice systems thank you fai thank you uh, i'm glad uh, um, but there seem to be two distinct opinions on what the exact uh, details of the case are but let's leave that aside for a moment right we are fundamentally debating here uh, how people who voices matter in the country think that uh, honor can be restored through the institution of marriage in respect of what the relationship between those two people are we're talking about the voice and choice and agency of a girl of a woman we are talking about uh, the confusion between seduction and rape we are talking about a culture of compromise uh, through the institution of marriage we're talking about the entire country being uh, more worried about uh, a government employee which is also you know referred to in a very honorable context right so you see that honor seems to be the most traded commodity in this country because it almost seems like you can give it you can take it uh, and the only people to be trading in it are men uh, and the woman has absolutely no agency when it comes to either bodily autonomy or sexual autonomy 
And I think this goes to the very, very root of what we find honorable and what we find of repute uh, and how we think it can be restored and taken away. So this brings back uh, a culture of shame, of shaming the victim, of ensuring that that shame can be restored through the institution of marriage, of that, inst of that decision still lying with that man in a case like this. Uh, and also, I think, you know, we're being, uh, I think we're being polite uh, and we're being kind by, uh, by distinctly referring to offline conversations versus, versus an order. I think what's, and I think we've given that leeway to the world, to the country for a very, very long time. That, you know, uh, we, we got to be politically correct when it comes to an order and say the right things. But offline, when we're thinking aloud, we pretty much can say what we believe in. And I think that leeway uh, is something that we, it's time that we take, take it back. In no offline conversation, in a case which we're assuming uh, is factually, in no, con in no case like this, is a conversation like that acceptable? Offline, online, through mm -hmm. order, without order, I mean, whether it is an offline conversation or is an uh, order here is okay. immaterial. Uh, and I think that distinction, that leeway, that space that we have given to the world to have a completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, to, I, I don't know what a nice word to use here is, but completely dishonorable conversations offline and say the politically correct things when they're online is, is, is a distinction that doesn't exist is a distinction that has gone too far, is a space that's gone too far. So one, I think I would encourage the entire panel to not make that distinction in the first place. Number two uh, is how we view honor uh, and also the intersection of institutions like marriage, honor, and of course, uh, the crime, uh, the, uh, and of course crime and what it can take away from a woman. Yes. And I think that's the conversation we need to have, even if we may continue to debate whether we whether we talk about item 14 or 13 uh, but uh, you know as far as the order goes and as far as the offline conversations goes there is a lot in this case that uh, anyone who believes in the constitution would fairly believe and accept as unacceptable you know um, nishta bharat rawal has said just a reminder this is the sanctity of marriage which the government spoke of when they opposed same-sex marriage the other day in the same court. So, you know, the government argued that we can't allow, um, you know, same-sex marriage in this country because there is a certain sanctity to that institution. And this is the sanctity we're talking about, where we basically ask rape accused if they're willing, if they're willing to marry the victim. And also I'm going to point out, uh, based on, and I'm re referring still to the reports on the bar and bench, um, based on those reports, uh, the lawyer of the accused came back later and said, you know what, we asked her, she doesn't want to marry us. So it was only later that the consent or the agency of the of the survivor was taken into this thing at all. She had no interest in marrying this person, apparently from, uh, from this report. So the idea that it's almost a given that a woman who has been, and I'm using air quotes, a woman who has been dishonored will want marriage in order to sort of restore her honor and they she perhaps and the only way to restore the yeah. and the only way to restore honor is to put her in a relationship of marriage with her accused so uh, honestly there's something very very troubling uh, about this conversation that we are having uh, and i think the sanctity of an institution somehow we have uh, found place to honor uh, and and regard marriage above all constitutional guarantees that a woman and a man gets and is uh, uh, receives in this country. I mean, uh, we don't seem to hold the sanctity of the constitution, but the constitution of marriage seems to supersede. And I think, Faye, let's also remind ourselves that 93% of violence against women is intimate partner violence. It is mm. within an institution that they trust. It is by someone that they let mm -hmm. in. Yeah. So as long as we have this conversation where we normalize violence, within the institution between the knowns, we are going to normalize the issue of violence. And I think that's the fundamental problem here, that we are not, uh, we are expecting the institution of marriage to supersede any right we expect that, that a person has. We are expecting the, the institution of marriage to supersede personhood. And I think that is a troubling conversation to have. I don't think we should be talking about this in 2021, really. 
Nobody absolutely we yes come in here. Firstly, yes, nobody is having this conversation. Nobody is saying, and nor has I I don't recall, except one judgment many, many years ago, which was decried at that time. After that, there have never been any discussion of ever anybody saying on marriage and therefore a rapist being asked to marry. So this this conversation is, I think, based on an incorrect premise. Okay. In fact, all the time, the courts have come down heavily. There was one judgment many years ago, I recall it, but it, it is something which we don't want to recall, so we'll never come. We shouldn't come there because that, that is not the mindset today. I'm very clear on this. That's not the mindset. And no one would even be party to such a mindset that you are saying in a case of rape, you're not talking of cases of promise to marry or a girl saying that. So those, those cases would be treated on a slightly different, uh, uh, you know, in a different parameter. But otherwise, this is not what the Supreme Court of India has been saying. Okay. And, and I don't agree with this. So we are not having a conversation. Nobody, I mean, nobody can ever have this kind of thought in today's day. So if we are saying that, yes, we are at one with that, that nobody can have yes. such conversation. Okay. Now, just, 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 just to put it very clearly, I think we're all unanimously, uh, we agree with uh, Nishta Satim of the fact that this is an, this is an unthinkable thing. Yes, you know, if it if it if it was said, it it's the it's it's horrible. It should have never said. All of us agree on that. What Miss Luther is arguing is that she believes it was misreported, uh, and that's not how the Supreme Court has judged in previous cases. I just want to put some perspective here from Brinda Adige because I know that Brinda Adige works on the ground with victims of abuse and uh, sexual harassment and rape, specifically when they are underage. Uh, Miss Adige, you know the perspective of mental and physical trauma that these children, and, and a 16-year-old, let's be honest, is a child. These children have to go through. Um, do you feel that a lot of times, and I'm making a slightly broader question now, do you feel a lot of times the people in police, people in, in uh, courtrooms don't really understand what that person has been through, what that individual has been through? Yes. 99% of the time, state agencies, beginning with the police, do not understand what mental, emotional, psychological trauma the particular victim is going through. Even though there are SOPs that say, this is the way you need to be asking, this is the way you need to take your statements, you need to go, especially if that victim is minor, you need to go to the place where she is comfortable or he is comfortable. It never really happens like that many times. You need to have somebody who she is comfortable with, that also doesn't happen. So first and foremost, let's place this on record that they do not have any education on mental health of the victim survivor, one. Two, they are also not trained to question that person in a sensitive manner. And they have no idea, no clue whatsoever. The whole understanding that they would come from is we are trying to investigate so as to file a case for you. Mm. So a lot of burden is on this person who has now come to make a complaint about the perpetrator. The onus of proof is on the perpetrator. So why are you, the police, placing that onus on this victim survivor who has come to you? So there is a lot of benevolence. There is also this uh, you know, idea put into this person that be very, very clear. You are going to court for the next 20 years. You will be going up and down. The this itself... She is already scared. She she can't come and talk to you because there has been a lot of threat on the other side. It is not easy for her to come and talk, and nobody will come and open their mouth. At some point, I think a judge had asked, "Why did you wait? Why did you wait four days or five days or something like that?" We need for these people, the prosecution, the police, the judges to understand, it takes a lot of time for this person to come to terms with that violence, aggression, with, with all that trauma, and then to decide, I want to make a complaint. First and foremost, to come out and speak about it. So when they ask these kind of questions in the court, it just goes to show that they are not just insensitive, they are certainly not learned. 
because you learn, you need to understand what is the research that has been done on people like them and why they find it difficult to come out and talk. Mm -hmm. There are victims who haven't spoken for 20 years. So don't get too upset when the victim has come and spoken after three months. Okay, there are all of these time frames that are there. I also yes. wanted to mention one bit where we have seen in courts where the, the, the judge is also trying to settle this matter in a yes. most amicable fashion. Yes. Recently, we heard about the street stalking, street sexual uh, uh, abuse that happened in one of the uh, states. And the judge said, why would you not tie? No, why don't you just tie a Rakhi and make him your brother? Mm -hmm. So how, do, how, how does this perpetrator become my brother? Yes. How, how would you decide that I must make this man my brother? So that after I make him my brother, I do not want to complain about him or that you do not want to do your job as per law. So uh, when we say that, you know, these conversations, these are conversations every day. We hear these whispers from judges and prosecutors and lawyers in the courtrooms. Right. So I, I just want to I just want to call out two more instances. Uh, there was the case of uh, the Kerala High Court case of a former priest, Robin uh, Varakumcheri, who asked for bail so he could marry his the survivor of the, the person he had raped. Who was who got pregnant at the age of 16? There was another case at the Odisha High Court where a rape convict asked for bail so he could marry the girl he had raped, who had now turned 18 and hence was eligible for his benevolence. Uh, so there have been other cases, although I must point out none of them. It happens, the happens all the time. Yeah, it happens all the time. You, and yes, I did actually. I did. So what I did was that I spoke to the reporter from Bar and Bench who had reported this precise story that we have been citing and who also reported the subsequent story. I looked at both stories and I did an analysis yes. of both. The person's name in the um, the case that Ms. Luthra was referring to was not Vijay. It was Vinay Pratap. Vinay okay. Pratap was not a government servant, firstly. Hmm. Secondly, what was said in the Vinay Pratap case was that if a couple is living together as man and wife, reportedly, again, I was yes. not in court, but a simultaneous broadcast of what happens at court is uh, in the press lounge. So this is not online, it's in the press lounge, uh, in the Supreme Court, in the premises. If a couple is living together as man and wife, the husband may be a brutal man, but can you call the act of sexual intercourse between a lawfully med wedded man and wife as rape? In 2021, the unthinkable is not at all unthinkable for a wide variety of pe people, including the government of India. I'm leading the case in the High Court to make marital rape a crime. What has the government said on affidavit? The government has said that the institution of marriage must be protected, thereby presuming that the institution of marriage per force, whether it includes rape or not, cannot withstand or whatever, cannot um, must gain priority over any complaints of rape. Of course, complaints of rape cannot be allowed. Occurrences of rape must be protected by the institution of merit. These conversations are happening. This conversation is happening in the High Court. When the Chief Justice of India, if this is correct, and I continue to say if to give him the benefit of the doubt, because our judiciary does not have a voice outside the courtroom and cannot speak. However, this is simultaneous reporting. I have looked at the stories and the two stories ap appear to reveal two very different facts. If yes. my case so, so goes second, to the Supreme Ms. Court, so, so what happens? It, so, so basically the story that I read out of the individual uh, called Mohit uh, Shivas Chavan, yes. who had in fact raped a 16 year old, who is a, a, a accused, accused of the 16 year old, who has, uh, you know, who was granted bail, then his bail was cancelled, has now approached the Supreme Court. This is this is the same case in which the question was asked, are you willing to marry her? Is that correct? Precisely. Let us also remember that under POXO, there is a reversal of the burden of proof. Yes. Uh, okay. so, so, so the case is accurate. Also, another quick question, and this one has come from Bharat Rawal, if I may also take this to Ms. Nandi. Is it likely he asks if, uh, you know, these reporting, uh, you know, these websites now reporting live, like live law and bar went likely to be censured uh, because of this kind of reporting and told to tone it down or maybe not report live. Is that something that might happen? It's entirely possible. But, you know, after the 
uh, the amendment after the legislative amendment there the truth should be a complete defense to contempt of court at the very least and unless you are interfering with the administration of justice then the contempt jurisdiction at all should not be there I, in my opinion it's very much overused mr rutra while uh, while uh, karna was checking i also verified from the lawyers yes. and uh, this uh, there was no comment about mohit's case because mohit's case seems to be the case of a minor but the other case was this exact facts as i have given and which is vinay's case so i may have called it vijay but it's the but same. he wasn't a government servant uh, so how could the comment have been made one uh, yes. citing a government servant saying you are a government servant uh, and I, you i don't know but the way the facts are that at the time that they were going around together they were both in the same call center it's written uh, in the so so okay so let me that's let me do this then mr that's the next case that's when i put let's just focus but uh, let's just... focus on on the case of uh, on, the on the case of mohit bas chavan versus state of maharashtra which is the one that we're discussing yes hmm. or you can go on the mohit case but yes. don't yes so the facts of the other case seem to be only to the extent that a a court is saying marital rape is yes. not offense yes and and that's not the case that i'm that i'm talking so court, about no but even in that case is the hmm. court saying that the husband may be a brutal man but can you call the act of sexual intercourse yes. between a lawfully wedded man and wife as rape there is a case there is a case pending in the high court Maybe where not only has notice been issued but detailed arguments are being heard right and so, so to reveal one one's argue. mind in that matter it's you do you, do we not think that there's a problem there there is big problem there's definitely a problem there will be hundreds of cases there are cases pending for uniform age of marriage there are cases pending for uniform adoption laws there's cases pending for uh, uniform laws for marriage for the uniform civil code what is pending is not law correct so, only so you feel that it's all right for a court that may hear a final judgment on marital rape to reveal its mind Any by entries? saying that the husband may be a brutal man but can you call the act of sexual intercourse uh, between a lawfully wedded man and wife is rape however brutal it may be is are you saying that that's all right uh, miss nandi it's 325 it may be many other offenses it may be 326 it may be 324 but it is obviously because statutory it's not rape at the moment that's not the law you are seeking to amend it but still you are We're talking okay. about okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Let me just let me just talk about propriety it is by a husband we're talking about judicial part. propriety we're not talking about a comment the on the law right? sorry it is a comment it's a comment on the law i'm so sorry it's a comment on the law And, and you think it's proper to reveal your one mind one on a case so of just, national yes. importance that is probably going to come before you in the next couple of years? Even the factual matrix in this case. I'm sorry, we don't want to spoil phase debate because they are always always so well organized and well spoken. Okay, But so, so let me let me ladies let me no, just no, take no. a minute to explain no, no. So, to our audience what is going on here. Uh, as per the rape laws of our country, it basically says very clearly. that if a man forces himself on a woman without her consent and there is penetration of any kind it tantamounts to rape on our country it, 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 under the law provided she is not his wife okay so which means effectively when you read it it means that if a man rapes a woman who is legally his wife it's not a crime yes um there are tons of things wrong with this everything i mean we could we could start a brand new debate now go on for another one hour about how many different things are wrong with this and like ms nandi pointed out uh, lawyers have been you know banging on the doors of the court repeatedly for decades trying to get this knocked out because it is no very very difficult the first challenge the first challenge was in 2015 the yes. one that we are currently arguing 
So, and, and even though our rape laws have been written and revised and made stronger, this one particular point has stayed. And this basically guts the basic argument of consent because what we're saying is that when a woman gets married, she effectively signs a blank check of consent to her husband and hands it over. Right. Her body is no longer hers and it belongs to him to do with it as he pleases. And that is a serious problem. I just want to bring in Nishta Satya, who's been listening again very patiently. Uh, but Satya, this, I mean, the idea of agency and the idea of consent which you brought up, uh, which is, let's be honest, at the base of all these arguments, including both of the cases that we're talking about, uh, is shocking because of where it places marital, uh, marital rape in our country, doesn't it? Well, absolutely, you know, we're all debating the accuracy of the case because to believe uh, that this is true is shocking. Uh, so, you know, honestly, we're, we're all hoping that this would be misreporting because if it was true in any form, then this really is appalling. So there are no two views about that. However, now that we're talking about mar marital rape, I think constitutionally regarding the institution of marriage above personhood is problematic above individual rights is problematic, above constitutional guarantees of equality and freedom is problematic. So there are no, uh, uh, so whether this is a blank check and whether consent is subject to the institution and the relationship that you're in with the man is also taking personhood agency, uh, consent, pretty much everything away from the woman, right? It's also subjecting the entire issue of sexual violence to circumstance. Uh, and I think that is not a zero tolerance to violence environment. That, that is basically saying violence in situation A is acceptable. Violence in, in, uh, uh, violence in situation B, we will have a law for and it's objectionable. Yeah. So basically what you're essentially doing is you're dividing the woman's life based on circumstance, her rights subject to circumstances that she's in, in conditions that she's she has she probably agreed to and in institutions that she is a part of uh, yeah. and I think that in totality is uh, is disregarding her personhood and I think that's a con that's a problem that's a problem uh, and that is in direct contrast with the constitutional guarantee of equality so I think, and in 2021 uh, we're a very progressively legislated country uh, and I think we're on our way uh, and I would love to believe, uh, Karuna, that we're on our way to debating this in the court. Uh, it is absolutely well, a matter of final arguments are finished, but it's going to go before another bench. It's been, it's been debated right. for a long time. Right. I, I want uh, to rephrase my... will find conclusion, yeah. but, uh, uh, but let us also understand that for very, very long, uh, you know, the amicability that we talk about is basically a culture of compromise. Uh, and forever that the burden of compromise has rested on the woman forever it has rested on her agency on her choice and on her voice so let's also relook at what we find amicable uh, yeah. uh, and what we okay. uh, so, what, so, you know, forgive me i have to i have to cut you short because we're running nice. out of time but uh, with the permission of our panelists and our audience i would like to put together uh, this group of people for a conversation on marital rape and the arguments that have been made for and against making this a law in our country. But I think that if if I may be just allowed to put forward- I can't, do it. I right can't do it on a TV show because I'm doing it in court. So you all yes. are, of course, okay. must yeah. debate yeah. it. Uh, I, I just want to put this, put this forward, right? Uh, before 2018, it was illegal to be gay in India. It was illegal for two men to have sex, two women to have sex. It was illegal. And to state that would be the law. But in a conversation to say, yes, I believe that two people who have sex should be thrown in jail is prejudice. And I think that's the argument that everybody's making here, that when someone actually thinks like this or states that question or asks that question, it seems to give us a window into this kind of thinking, which seems like prejudice. It seems like prejudice against the woman. It seems like prejudice towards the man. And now as a jigsaw puzzle, you put one case, you, you put the, those two windows together, one that suggests that do you want to marry this person, the other one that suggests that marital rape is not really a problem. What you're doing effectively is handing over an individual to a rapist and saying, now it's okay to rape this person for the rest of her life because legally you're allowed to do so. That is what is irking women across the country right now. And this is obviously not something we can discuss in one hour. This is something we have to have repeated conversations about because 
God help us if we have to change every single mind in this country and break the patriarchy that way. But that's what we'll do if that's what it takes. I'm going to leave it here. Our news is coming up in less than 60 seconds, 10 minutes of everything that happened in the country today. Thank you for watching. To my panelists, thank you for your patience. Good night.